Well, the time's come for me to reveal my inner kaiju fan to the world. It's no secret to anybody who knows me that I am a die-hard Godzilla fan. I've been pretty much obsessed with the franchise since I was three years old, to the point where now I am pretty much a walking encyclopedia of giant monster movie knowledge. And to get myself hyped up for Godzilla vs. Kong, I have been marathoning every single Godzilla film from 1954 until 2019. And I'm still not done, but the one thing that I find truly fascinating about the character and the franchise at large is that Godzilla started out as a harrowing but fairly straightforward allegory for the horrors of the Atomic Age. But in a franchise with 30 plus films spanning over 60 years, the characters evolved along with Japan and society at large's needs, and we see him go from merciless monster to loving father, from menacing villain to the savior of Japan to an unstoppable force of nature. From hero to villain to hero to villain. From the franchise's dumbest to its most heartbreaking, there's something in Godzilla for everybody. And before we dive into America's second and more successful attempt at the big guy, I just want to give you guys a quick update on my Kickstarter for my new short film, Diviner. Not only did we raise our entirety of our 3K goal in the span of the first three days, but we still have a little over a month to go, and it's not over yet. We still have stretch goals, and we're still trying to meet the ideal budget for the film, now that it's guaranteed to be made either way. If you want to check that out, link is in the description. Now then, back to the giant monsters. Legendary's Godzilla 2014 is directed by Gareth Edwards. It stars Brian Cranston, Godzilla, and Aaron Taylor Johnson as the military's first ever robotic soldier. Looks just like a human, but has no emotions. And it tells the story of Godzilla, ancient radioactive alpha predator dinosaur, and his intense anger over two giant parasitic monsters being horny. And there's some human stuff going on too in the background. So this movie had a lot riding on it. After America's first colossal fuck up with TriStar's 1998 Godzilla film, the fact that Hollywood even got a second chance is fairly miraculous. So pretty much, if they messed up a second time, Toho would likely never let them have the rights to the character again. And you know what? I think they got it right. Legendary's Godzilla is a really strong entry in the franchise. It's not perfect by any means, but what it gets right, this movie really gets right. From the apocalyptic spectacle of it all, to seeing Godzilla in big-budget, breathtaking CGI, to seeing monster fights on the big screen that amount to more than rubber suits smacking against each other, not that there's anything wrong with that. If you're a fan of the franchise or of this character, this movie will have plenty for you to enjoy. Everything about this movie involving Godzilla is absolutely glorious. Not only does he look and sound incredible, but the way they went about his actual character and his behavior is awesome. This is one of my favorite takes on Godzilla since the Heisei series. He's just a big animal, and his behaviors are based on real animals. They modeled his fighting style in these films after bears and crocodiles and Komodo dragons. And it really shines through during the final battle with the Mudos. He's vicious and animalistic and awesome, and it adds a sense of realism when you're seeing them not just smacking each other like the older films. Of course, the trademark atomic breath is still here, and while he only uses it sparingly in this film, every instance is jaw-dropping. The first time I saw this in theaters with my friend, he and I were just clasping hands in sheer awe. But the King of the Monsters needs monsters to fight, and we actually get that in the 2014 Godzilla film, unlike the 1998 one. The Mudos, massive unidentified terrestrial organisms even though one of them can fly. As far as Godzilla monsters, they're pretty cool. Nothing crazy special, especially design-wise, they just kind of look like big insectoid versions of the Cloverfield monster. But, like Godzilla, they have a lot of personality that shines through. There are a lot of little details and nuances to their behavior that I find fascinating in the same way that I would find, you know, watching a show about animals on Discovery Channel fascinating. We get to see how they interact with each other, how they respond to external stimuli. There's a recurring thing where the female Mudo will mimic sounds that she's hearing around her, from the soldier's walkie-talkie, to a train horn, to the ticking of a live nuke. Again, like Godzilla, they're just big animals. The female is wailing when her nest is destroyed and all her babies are killed, and I kind of feel bad for a bit. It's probably not the best thing for them to be running around with live nukes as baby food, but in the end, they are just trying to mate and survive. But considering they're a parasitic species to Godzilla's species, it makes sense that he'd want to stop the horny before they can procreate. Gareth Edwards does his best to shoot these monsters exclusively from perspectives where humans could be standing in order to emphasize their scale and my god does it work. We get some stellar shots from the human perspective on the ground showcasing how enormous these creatures are. There's a scene that always stands out to me when I watch this movie, and it's the scene where the male Mudo dive-bombs a ship in order to steal the nuke, 
there's this incredible shot of him stepping out of the water in front of a car and you see it all through this car's windshield and it really just highlights how huge these things are in comparison to normal everyday things around us. And of course there's the big guy's first appearance in Hawaii where the simple sight of his foot stomping down sets an entire screaming crowd into hushed silence. Now the Jaws technique that Edwards pulls with Godzilla's first appearance is great. It makes for some awesome build-up, it focuses more on the force of nature aspect of the movie, showcasing just the destruction left by him and making it feel a lot more apocalyptic and weighty. Godzilla feels massive. You feel the weight behind all of his movement. The simple act of him coming ashore causes so much water displacement that it results in a tsunami. And it makes for an excellent eventual payoff when, it, when he confronts the Mudo at the airfield right before it cuts away. And that's where the Jaws technique becomes frustrating, because yeah, it's cool when it's leading up to seeing the monster. It's not cool when you're teasing us with fights for 90% of the runtime only to not show them and cut back to human drama that we don't care about. The airport fight is a cock tease that I'm capable of excusing, because the lead up is so damn good that I don't care. But by the fifth or sixth time that a fight is set up and then we cut away to boring as sin human storyline, yeah, it gets frustrating. So yeah, let's talk about the human storyline. The human storylines in Godzilla films, 9 out of 10 times, are the worst part of any Godzilla film. And that's not to say there haven't been any Godzilla films with good human storylines, there have been a few. G2014 isn't one of them. The cast of human characters here is fairly one note, with most of the story centering around Aaron Taylor Johnson and Elizabeth Olsen's family and his struggle to return to his wife and kid. This is fine on a surface level considering it's basically framed as a disaster movie, but it's pretty hard to care about a lot of it since Ford and Elle and their son are the most bland, forgettable characters in history. Especially Ford. Aaron Taylor Johnson is a capable actor who I've loved in several films. This is one of the weakest performances I've ever seen from him. I don't know if he's just phoning it in because he doesn't take this subject matter seriously, or if the character is just one note, or if it was an intentional choice where he's trying to play it reserved because he's a soldier. Either way, it doesn't work. The best parts of the human element of this story have the least to do. Brian Cranston, who is arguably the most interesting human character in the movie, and easily gives the best performance in the movie, is absolutely wasted here and dies within the first hour. And for the remaining runtime, we're left with this militarized block of wood as our protagonist. Ken Watanabe is the other human highlight playing this film's version of Dr. Serizawa. This Serizawa doesn't have nearly as much significance to the plot as the original Dr. Serizawa. He brings what he can to this character, showcasing a man who has seen the horrors of nuclear war, his father lived through Hiroshima, who views Godzilla as nature's answer to keeping the world in balance. He's dedicated his life to studying the big guy, and as a result, you can see that he kind of respects and admires him in a way. Plus, if nothing else, he's got some badass lines. Let them fight. 2014's Godzilla is far from the best in the franchise, but for an American take on the character, it's far more respectable than 1998. While it might not be the best Godzilla film, or even the best one made by the US, it does a lot right, and it's a very necessary film. Legendary had to show that they understood the character before they were able to go crazy with him. It's basically America's answer to the 1954 Godzilla, a film that, at its core, is framed as a serious apocalyptic disaster movie, where the disaster just happens to be giant monsters. And while it might not be a harrowing look at nuclear power the way the original film was, Legendary's Godzilla tackles a very different theme throughout its franchise, and as a result has a completely new take on the character. Godzilla, being the force of nature that he is, can't be stopped or reasoned with, or even really is something that acknowledges the wants or needs of humanity at all, who are basically just ants to him. And we, as the humans in this movie, are still naive enough to believe that we have any semblance of an ability to control that let alone stop it. Mankind loves to try and play God even in the face of something immovable and uncaring. And in respect to that, I think it's best to let Dr. Serizawa sum it up because I can't make a heavy-handed explanation of these themes sound nearly as cool as Ken Watanabe can. The arrogance of man is thinking nature is in our control, and not the other way around. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, click down there, like, comment, subscribe. There's a Patreon link and a Kickstarter link down in the description if you want to be like any of these cool people. Please donate. I need to make this movie as good as possible, and I would I need all y'all's help. Please. Thank you for watching. I love you. Bye.